Entrepreneurship is all about transforming the world by solving big problems. Once Mahatma Gandhi has said, be the change you wish to see in the world. This quote keeps us grounded and reminds us to stay unique and not to do what everyone else in our industry is doing. What works for someone else may not work for us and this quote reminds us to stay true to us if we expect to see a difference in our business and in the impact we make. So entrepreneurship is about seeing opportunities and bringing about change. What the entrepreneurship definition doesn't tell you is that entrepreneurship is what people do to take their career and dreams into their hands and leads it in the direction of their own choice. It's about building a life on your own terms. No bosses, no restricting schedule and no one holding you back. Entrepreneurs are able to take the first step into making the world a better place for everyone in it. Always remember why you started. All right then. I, Bowen, good morning everyone present here. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Fediolink International Campus, I'm your host for this wonderful morning, Yumi, and I extend very warm and hearty welcome to each one of you here. I hope you all hoping to be entrepreneurs and some of you already are entrepreneurs or business owners, but still some of us are curious about how to run a business in Sri Lanka. So this is the best opportunity for you all to grab it all from an industry expert and a well-educated personality. Gayani is an alumni of University of Colombo, an attorney at law and hold a Master of Laws degree in Employment and Human Resource. She received her executive education from IVLP USA and Southeast Asian Leadership Academy in USA. Over 13 years of operational experience locally and overseas as a social sustainability and human resource professional, she worked at Mass Active and Mass Creda for 11 years and was instrumental in implementing socially conscious practices in the garment sector and was responsible for obtaining fair trade certification. She has the unique ability to cater to diverse workforce requirements and influence the senior management to embed ethical human resource practices. Gaini commenced her consultancy services in human resource management and uh, as a specialist in labor law in 2019. With the aim of sharing her expertise and to foster ethical business practices with a wider community. Her passion for changing the landscape has led her to be a lecturer and speaker in human resource management and labor law. She lives by the principles that is advocated and volunteers as legal pillar lead for professionals without borders Lanka. Supporting startups and small medium enterprises as a head of human resource and legal at Shanti Margam and NGO supporting mental well-being of children and Adolescents. Warmly welcome Gayani Ranasinghe, the co host of today's webinar, to take you along with the entrepreneur journey. Thank you, Pyumim, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, that was a fantastic introduction. Thank you. So, uh, before we start uh, the lecture, I wanted to kind of uh, explain to you some of the house rules that we're going to have, right? So, that's going to make this webinar effective for everybody. Uh, please have your microphones on mute. If you have a question, please put it on the chat. And uh, Pumi will be keeping an eye out for all the questions coming in. And she will be giving it to me. Right. So this lecture is for one hour and 15 minutes. And at the latter part of the 15 minutes, we will be answering all your questions. Right. Uh, so I will be switching off my camera. That is to give me some freedom of movement so that when I'm lecturing, I have the ability to kind of stand up or like move around if I want to, right? So please bear with me on that. If you have trouble viewing my slides or hearing me, please drop a message and Pumi will get in touch with me, right? Right. Uh, so let's begin the lecture and let me uh, share my slides with you. Give me a minute.
I hope everyone can see my slides. Right. So let's start. So I want to explain to you all briefly as to why we are doing this session, specifically on the legal basics for entrepreneurs. Uh, in Sri Lanka, as you know, many business owners view complying with the law with skepticism. Most think that doing a business is at the cost of ethics and complying with the law. Realistically, if you adhere to the law, you will face fewer issues with the government authorities, your employees, your suppliers, your customers, etc. Of course, taking shortcuts, finding gray areas in the law and circumventing the law might seem like a good idea in the short term. But keep in mind, if you're doing business, looking at the long term growth and sustaining the business, you have to buckle up and adhere to the law. I think before we started this session, we watched a couple of videos of very famous entrepreneurs around the world, and they all said the importance of uh, committing your time to it, right? So if you're going to commit a lot of time to a, a passionate cause that you have, then it's important that you commit it, commit the time correctly. So I want to share with you a quote, right? This is by Kevin Plank, founder and CEO of Under Armour. And he says, it starts with not having a hangover with the way things used to be. So I want you to think of this quote in this context, that whatever the business that you are going to do or you're already in, would already have other players or competitors. Don't worry about whether they are complying with the law and whether you should do it. The answer is very simple. Yes, you should do it. Don't have, a, don't have a hangover with the way things used to be and how you need to be. This will set you apart from your competitors and give your business global recognition. Right, so let's uh, get on to uh, today's topics, right? So we're going to talk about four basic areas. Firstly, formalizing the business structure. We're going to understand the types of different business structures available in Sri Lanka and choosing the right fit for you as an entrepreneur. Right? And another important thing is foreign companies engaging in business in Sri Lanka. So if you have a foreign investor, how should you go about it? Secondly, familiarize yourself with the labor law. What are the ways to hire? What are the fundamental labor laws that you really need to know? And what are the labor laws that you need to keep an eye on as you grow the business? Thirdly, we will be discussing intellectual property in a nutshell. We'll be discussing four types of intellectual property, which is important for an entrepreneur and things to watch out for. Fourthly, contract management. Understanding contract law and some of the very basics of it. So we'll start off with our first topic, formalizing the business structure. So there are three major types of business structures that you can have a sole proprietor, proprietorship or a sole owner, a partnership or a company, right? So all of these three has their own pros and cons and unique features to it. So what are these unique features, right? So let's take a look in depth as to each of these categories and try and understand which would fit you best? So first off is sole entrepreneur proprietorship. Sole proprietorship is basically a one person business. So there's only one person who owns it. That could be you. There is no differentiation between the owner and the business. 
So that means the business has no specific legal entity. There are pluses in this. One, you can take all the profit because you're the single owner. But there's a big disadvantage in here. That is liability is unlimited. What do we mean by liability? Liability is in the running of your business. If you get into debt, then you are responsible for paying off all of that liability and your personal property too is liable to be sold off to ensure that debt is paid. So in terms of the tax rate, the personal income tax rate would apply, right? Of course, it's very easy to set up. Since you are the owner, you have direct control of the business, right? You have very few reporting requirements, right? But the disadvantages would be there would be a limit in your ability to raise capital. Your company is as wealthy as you are personally, personally wealthy. And there's a lack of continuity of the business. So if something happens to you, uh, the disease of the owner would mean that there's the lifetime of the business would end with that. So how do you register a sole proprietorship in Sri Lanka? Right? So in terms of Sri Lanka, you can carry on the business in a different name to that of the full name of the owner, right? If you do it that way, I'll give you an example. Let's say you are Malini Pereira and you have a business and you call it Malini Salon. Then you need to register the name of the business. The name is Malini Salon, right? So you're not registering the company, but you're registering the name of the business. So how do you register this business name? This is a process where you need to go to your respective divisional secretariat and get the relevant documents. So just leave this here because I will be discussing this again when we're talking about partnerships, right? So it's a very simple process where you go and basically register the name of the business. What are the advantages of registering the name of the business? Firstly, you create an identity. What's that identity? Marlini Salon, right? And you also have the ownership of that business name. Right, moving on to partnerships. Partnerships is where you have two or more owners. There's a maximum number of owners that you can have, and that is 20 persons. But please remember that this 20 does not apply to, part, to partnerships carrying on the practice as attorneys at law, provided all of whom is an attorney at law. Secondly, a practice that has accountants, all of whom are chartered accountants, a practice as members of licensed stock exchange, all of whom is members of that licensed stock exchange. So other than for these three categories, all other partnerships has to stick to the restriction of 20 partners, right? This is set out in section 519 of the Companies Act, right? So again, when you take the legal entity, the owners and the business, there is no differentiation, right? And what is important here is that you have to have a partnership agreement. If the capital exceeds 1000 rupees, this is set out in the Prevention of Frauds Ordinance. So please remember, if your capital exceeds 1000 rupees, you need to get into a partnership agreement with the other partners. This partnership agreement would cover specific terms and conditions in terms of how you share your profits, right? Uh, what happens if a partner dies? Things like that. 
right? So the profit will be shared as agreed under the partnership agreement. Liability here, much similar to sole proprietorship, is unlimited. So what does that mean? The debt of your partnership is unlimited. And if you do not, if your partnership does not have the money to pay, your personal property is also liable. Right. And there's another disadvantage in partnerships, and this is a big one. That is joint liability. So let's say I have a partnership with five people. And one of the partners decides to take a particular bank loan for which all four of us do not agree upon. Even though the four of us do not agree upon it, since one partner did take that loan, we are jointly liable to pay for it. And we are jointly liable in the case of a debt arising out of it, right? So as you can see, a partnership has unlimited liability, it has joint liability, and can easily reflect, uh, and can easily have partner conflicts, right? And there are also issues in terms of continuity of the business unless they're specifically stated in the partnership agreement. The advantages are, of course, it's very easy to set up, right? I'll explain to you how to set it up in a, in a, in a bit. And you also have the ability to raise capital because unlike in a sole proprietorship where you were one person, here now you have five, right? So you have the ability to raise capital from all five of these partners. Right. And you also have a diverse resource set because all five of these partners that you have will have different strengths and you have the ability to use all their resources in make your partnership grow. Of course, you have shared control. So that will ensure that all your decisions are, are vetted out and agreed upon. Unlike a sole proprietorship where decisions are taken all on your own and there is no other input coming in. So how do you register a partnership? Right? So as I said, registering a partnership and registering a sole proprietorship is similar. But there are one distinct difference is that in terms of the sole proprietorship, you are going to register the name. In terms of the partnership, you're going to register the partnership or that firm, right? So what you do is you go to the relevant district secretariat, right? And you kind of tell them briefly, what is this new industry that you're hoping to start, right? They will ask you a few questions, right? And they will give you maybe sometimes just one application or a couple of couple of more other documents, right? This depends on the industry that you are engaged in. For example, if you're going to start up a, a lodging or an accommodation, then you will be re required to get a report from the relevant police division. If you're going to start a restaurant or an eatery, then you need approval from the health, public health inspector or the PHI. Right. So when you speak to the divisional secretary, tell your specific industry and then they will give you the relevant forms. If it's a salon, then all you need to do is submit your training certificates along with that application. Right. So once you filled in this application and got the other relevant documentation as well, then you go and meet your grammar sevaka. Right. When you go to meet your grammar sevaka, you take a copy of your NIC uh, and also the place of business that you're operating from, say you have a lease agreement or say you're starting it from your parents' home or your own home, uh, your own home belonging to maybe your spouse, right? Then you need a consent letter from that owner saying that they have no objection for you to start in this business in this premises, right? So there are these few documents that you need to take when you go and meet your grammar center. So the Grama Sevaka will come and do a little investigation. So the Grama Sevaka will come and visit this place of business. It's great if you can have a little name board placed as well. 
right? So that kind of gives you an indication that the business can already have commenced, right? That's not an uh, obstacle in getting registration. So you can have your business already started and working, right? The grammar Sevika will visit the site and then give a report, right? So what you need to do is collect all the relevant uh, documentations, the application given by the divisional secretary, the grammar Sevika report, and give all of these documents to the divisional secretariat for approval right so that's the basic approval process if you want to register a partnership or if you want to register the name of a sole proprietorship right now we're moving on to companies there are five types of companies that can be incorporated, right? So three of these we'll be talking in depth. What are they? The private limited company, limited company, and public limited company. I will be discussing all three of this at length. The other two, I thought I will just share it with you in this very brief context, because in terms of an entrepreneur, these two have very little attraction. In terms of an unlimited company, the term unlimited in itself will tell you that you're unlimited in liability, right? So because of this feature of unlimited liability, practically there are hardly any companies registered in Sri Lanka under an unlimited company, right? So this is not your go-to first um, idea when you want to start a company. The other is limited by guarantee. Companies that are limited by guarantee are formed for the benefit of the public, right? They are set up for a specific objective. It's either to prom promote commerce, art, science, religion, charity, sport, etc. You're restricted to utilizing the profits. You can only use the profits to further the objectives that I spoke to you. The objective could be art, science, religion, charity. These are basically not for profit companies, NGOs. And you're not permitted to share the profits with its members because, as I said, the profits has to be utilized to further the objectives of forming that limited by guarantee company. So now we will discuss private limited company. In terms of the private limited companies, you have to have minimum one shareholder and one director. So that means a private limited company can be owned by one person or a maximum number of 50 shareholders. Here, the most important thing, unlike a sole proprietorship or a partnership, is that the owner or owners and the business is separate. The business has its own legal entity. So what does that mean? The business entity has the capacity to hold property, be sued, and pay off debt. So as an owner, your personal property will not be liable if there are debts in the company, right? So your liability as an owner is limited to the value of the shares that you invested in the company. The profit is shared amongst the shareholders. And here the tax rate is the corporate income tax rate that would apply. Another thing that I want to um, tell you is that in terms of a private limited company, that particular name of the company would end in the words private limited. I've indicated this at the bottom of the slide or PDG LTD, right? So if you see a company saying PDG LTD or private limited, then you know that this is a private limited company. 
The advantages of a private limited company is, as I said, limited liability. And of course, you get professional recognition, unlike it being a sole proprietorship or a partnership. There's a face to your company. And there is limited reporting as opposed to a public limited company. But of course, if you are a private limited company, you have to have accounting and bookkeeping practices, right? Another disadvantage is you cannot raise capital from the public like a public limited company. You can raise capital individually and issue shares to anyone you want, but not from the public at large, right? Then another disadvantage is limitations on transferability of shares. What is meant here is that the directors have the right to refuse to trans to register the transfer, right? So if you want to transfer your shares, you need the director, all of the directors consent to do that. Otherwise they can refuse to transfer the shares. So how do you register a private limited company? So this has now become an online process and it's really easy to do, right? So there are only three basic steps and you can do this on your own. And this is the beauty of it. So I know most of you would think, should we get a lawyer or a company secretary to help us out in this? But if you go to the website and I have indicated the uh, website at, in my last slide, right? It would be very simple for you to go and do this on your own. So the first step is that you have the ability to go and reserve your company name. And this is valid for three months, right? So before you get all your documents in order, you can go and reserve your company name, right? So, but there are some restrictions on the name that you can have for your private limited company. And this is set out in Section 7 of the Companies Act. So you cannot have a name that is identical with another company. right? Or it cannot have words like president or presidential because those words would suggest that there is some form of patronage by the president of Sri Lanka or the government department. You also cannot use words like municipal, incorporated, cooperative, society, right? Because this would also mean there's some kind of connection with a municipality or a local authority. You can't also use words like national, state or Sri Lanka because then it would suggest that you have some kind of governmental connection, right? So other than these restrictions, the name restrictions, there are some more, but here I've just given you a flavor of it, right? You can choose any name for your company and you can reserve that. And this reserve reservation is valid for three months, right? The step two of this is submitting the company registration forms. So there are three forms that you need to fill in, right? the company registration, form one, form 18, the consent and certificate of directors, form 19, consent and certificate of secretary or secretaries, right? Together with these three sets of forms, you need to submit your articles of association, right? So here again, you have an option. You can either draft your own articles of association or simply adopt the model articles of associations in the website. So this is actually a very easy and simple method, right? Uh, you can adopt the model articles of association, tweak it a little bit to suit your specific needs, right? And then there is, of course, registration fees, right? Uh, what are these fees and how much is that included? All of this is easily available in the website, right? Then once you do all of this, it's very simple. You will receive your certificate of incorporation, right? 
you will receive an online uh, registration, which is an e-certification, and you can also go and collect the hard copy. Right, so uh, moving on to a limited company. So in terms of a limited company, you have a minimum of one shareholder and one director, but there is no maximum number of shareholders. So that is the difference between a private limited and a limited company. And also remember, you are not listed on the stock exchange. In terms of the legal entity, the owner and the business are separate legal entities. So your liable liability is limited to the value of the shares owned by the shareholders. Right? The profit is shared amongst the shareholders and the tax rate is the corporate income tax rate that would apply. So in terms of a limited company, your company name would end in the word limited or LTD. Some of the advantages is that your liability is limited and you, ha you have the ability to raise capital from the public. But there's a way to do it. This is what we call as prospectus rules, right? Prospectus rules is when you offer shares to the public, you have to publish a booklet containing details about the business, accounts, report by the auditor, to say that the company is stable, financially stable. These rules ensures that the public who do not know the nitty gritties of the limited company, that they do not invest in a dud company, right? So the prospectus rules are applicable and ensures that the public is protected by not investing in a dud company, right? One of the other um, um, strict regulations that they have is called the solvency test, right? This is where before you distribute the profits amongst the shareholders, you need to satisfy that the company is solvent, that the company is in actual profitable. Right? Uh, and another disadvantage would always be the cost of going public. So if you do want to go public, right, uh, you need to publish your booklets and there's a form of advertising and uh, you need to also prepare the report report by the auditor, so all of this is going to cost you some money. A public limited company, right? A public limited company, you can have a minimum of one shareholder and one director, but there is no maximum number of shareholders and you're listed on the stock exchange. The owner and the business have separate legal entities. So that means, again, your liability is limited to the value of shares that is owned by the shareholders, right? Um, your company name would end in the word public limited company or PLC, right? So some of the advantages is limited liability, right? The ability to raise capital because you have the ability to list on the stock exchange. So you have the ability to raise capital from the public and the ease of transferring shares, right? Some of the disadvantages would be that you have strict regulations, right? There are a lot of accounting, bookkeeping and other regulations that you need to adhere to because you are a public limited company. You have heavy reporting requirements because the public needs to know the performance of your company as the public has the ability to invest in your company, right? There's a cost of going public. And of course, another disadvantage is 
it's subjective market value. So uh, the public's opinion of your company. Good sir, put inside, inside this. Right. Uh, so having discussed the companies, I want to kind of explore with you all a foreign company engaging in business in Sri Lanka. Right. So if you are a foreign company, there are four methods of doing business in Sri Lanka. What are they? Firstly, you can directly provide goods and services without a place of business in Sri Lanka. Right. So that means you don't have a place of business in Sri Lanka. An example would be Amazon office in UK directly shipping goods to customers in Sri Lanka. Right. So you have no place of business, but you're directly providing the goods or the services. Secondly, you're directly providing goods and services, but you have a place of business in Sri Lanka. So what do we mean by you have a place of business in Sri Lanka? It means either you have a branch office, a project office, a liaison office, or a representative office in Sri Lanka. Right. To do this, you need to register yourself as an overseas company, right? And if I give you some examples of branch office could be like HSBC, right? So you incorporated in Hong Kong, but you, you register yourself as an overseas company in Sri Lanka, and then you can have your branch office, right? If your company, which is registered overseas, carries on any commercial trading or industrial activity, commercial meaning banking, industrial meaning manufacturing activity, and you have a place of business in Sri Lanka, there's a minimum investment requirement in Sri Lanka. That is 200,000 US dollars or equivalent in any other foreign currency, right? So if you have, if you want to have a place of business in Sri Lanka and you are carrying on a commercial trading or industrial activity, then there's a minimum investment. So please keep that in mind. Thirdly, you have a subsidiary incorporated in Sri Lanka, right? So any person who is resident outside of Sri Lanka, right? So this can be uh, one of your uncles or relatives who's wanting to invest, right? And you have the ability to have or hold all the shares of the capital of a Sri Lankan company in most sectors. I will explain this to you, right? So that means if you are a foreigner you, and you want to invest in Sri Lanka, you can own 100% of the share capital of a Sri Lankan company in most sectors. But there are certain sectors that are limited. This is done through the Foreign Exchange Act, right? I will give you some of the limitations. For example, only 40% of the stated capital can be owned by a foreign company if you are in any one of these trades. So these are just three examples that I've given, right? The Foreign Exchange Act has several more. If you are growing and primary processing of tea, rubber, coconut, cocoa, rice, sugar, and spices, then the maximum stated capital a foreign company can own is 40%. The same apply if you're in the education or travel agencies, right? So that is the 40% limitation for a foreign company. But there is another set that is where even if it's 1%, permission has to be obtained first. So there is no form of automatically you being able to own even a single share of capital in a Sri Lankan company if you are in the business of air transportation, manufacturing of arms, ammunition, explosives, military vehicles and equipment, right? If you're manuf manufacturing alcohol, narcotics, producing coins and currencies, lotteries. So these are just some examples. Then permission is required, right? So 
where do we need to get this permission from, right? So what the Foreign Exchange Act states is that um, even if the percentage of the stable capital has to be given special approval by the government of Sri Lanka or any other legal administrative authority set up for the approval of foreign investments. So for any of these that permission is required, you need to first go and obtain permission, right? Uh, the other is, if you're going to engage in the retail trade in Sri Lanka, right? So if you want to open up some kind of a supermarket chain, right? Then there's a minimum investment that is 5 million of US dollars, right? So as you can see, if you want to open a subsidiary, if you want to have a subsidiary incorporated in Sri Lanka, then there are some restrictions that are following, okay? And the fourth is a foreign company where you do business by engaging a local agent or a franchise. So you have a local agent or franchise, right? So you don't wish to invest in a subsidiary in Sri Lanka, right? So as you can see, if you want to invest in a subsidiary in Sri Lanka, it's a little complicated. But you can enter into an agency or a franchise agreement with a Sri Lankan company, right? So the so the Sri Lankan company need not have any shareholding link with the foreign company, right? And the Sri Lankan company will be responsible for retaining employees and carrying on the business activities in Sri Lanka on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is done through a franchise or an agency agreement with the Sri Lankan company. So these are the four ways in which a foreign company can engage in a, a business in Sri Lanka. Right, so that is basically all on business structures and choosing the right fit for your company. We are now going to uh, move on to labor law. Right? And what are the basics of labor law that you should know? So I want to talk to you about the ways to hire. There are four basic ways that you can hire, right? And um, all of these four ways, I'm sure you're all familiar with, right? The first is very simple. You have employees, right? We call this a contract of service, right? Or you can hire independent contractors or self-employed people to your company. So this is called a contract for services. Please note the difference of off and for. I will explain this to you later as we go along. Right? The other most uh, famous one, which lots of entrepreneurs do, is you hire your labor through a manpower agency. Right? This is because when you're starting off, you begin to realize that you don't want to have any employees under you. So what you do is you would have a contract with the manpower agency. The manpower agency would hire the relevant people under that manpower agency and you would use their services, right? The other, and I think this is something that uh, Sri Lankan entrepreneurs do not really explore much, is the digital labor platforms that are out there. And I really encourage you to kind of take a look at these because if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to hire labor, right the digital labor platforms really offers you a global pool of talent right so freelancer.com upwork.com these are all forms of digital labor platforms that enables you to hire the best talent and they are also independent contractors and you would have very little um, labor law requirements when you hire persons from the digital labor platform right so this is a very interesting space to explore so now let me kind of uh, explain to you contract of service versus a contract for services right so a contract of service is basically an employer employee relationship and this is governed under the labor law right in terms of a contract for services these are self-employed people or independent contractors. So there is no employer-employee relationship, 
right? So these could be your consultants that you've hired, right? And they are governed under contract law, not labor law, right? So if you have an employer-employee relationship, right, then remember that you qualify for all employment protection rights and benefits. So what does that mean? It means that you as the employer have the duty to provide work. Right? You are liable to pay EPF, ETF, right? And in the case of redundancy or in the case of you winding up your company, then you also are liable for redundancy payment, right? Um, you can have your employees working under a full-time permanent contract, right? Or it can be on a part-time basis or even on a fixed term basis, right? All of these are possible under a contract of service. But it's important to note that in Sri Lanka, we don't have a lot of regulations governing part-time work or for that matter, fixed term employment, right? So if you are offering fixed term employment, please, uh, please note that you cannot keep on extending the contract indefinitely because at some point or other, uh, there are case law to show that if you keep on uh, extending the fixed term contract indefinitely, then that employee has the right to assume I'm a permanent employee and you will be, that per employee will be counted as a permanent employee and not a person on a fixed term contract, right? So in terms of a contract for services, right? As you are self-employed, as you are considered as a self-employed person, right? you do not have any employment protection rights and benefits. So you will not be paying EP and EPF just for these category of self-employed persons, right? And you will be working under a professional consultancy agreement. So this is not an employment contract, right? So you will hire a professional on an assignment basis or on a project basis to deliver a certain uh, targets that you've set out, right? But there's a lot of confusion when it comes for contract of service and contract for services, right? Because many people considering, many companies considering the fact that you do not have to pay EPF for contract for services, decide to put many employees under a contract for services. And this has become a huge problem in Sri Lanka, right? So there is a simple way in which the labor department and the courts try to differentiate these two and how do they do that, right? So what's important to know is how do you understand the difference between a contract of service and a contract for service is that it is not governed by any specific legislation or laws, right? No statutory, statutory guidelines. What it does have is you rely on tests that are formulated by the courts. So over the years, the courts have developed certain tests that, we, that they put. I will explain to you what these tests are. They apply these tests to see, is it a contract of service? Is this person an employee? Or is this a contract for service? Is this person a self-employed person, right? Please note that the courts have no regard or very little regard for the label that you have attached. So it doesn't matter if you have given that person a professional consultancy service, right? Courts is not going to be bothered about the label that you have given to it. Courts is only interested in applying these tests to understand is this person truly an employee or is this person truly a self-employed person? Right. So what are these tests? There are four tests and I want you to understand this because if you understand the four tests, then you would understand, am I giving a person employment or am I giving a person a professional consultancy and is this person truly a self-employed person? Right. So the first test is called a control test. Control test is basically trying to ascertain under whose control is this person under? 
So how do you understand control? You understand control by deciding who has the power to decide the following. Who has the power to decide what work will be performed? Who has the power to decide how the work will be carried out? Right? And what are the means employed in performing that work? And the time and place of work. Who decides these? If the majority of the answer is that it is the master, there's a controlling person who decides all of this, then the person who gives you the service will be considered an employee and not a self-employed person, right? Because a self-employed person can decide on their own the time and place of work, the means that person is going to adopt in performing that work, how the work is going to be carried out, and what work will be performed, right? So that is the control test. The second is the integration test. The integration test is understanding, is that person an integral part of the other's organization? What do we mean by integral part, right? So how you ascertain the integral part is by understanding what is the work that is performed by that person and is that work an integral part or is it just an accessory to the business, right? So I'll give you an example. Let's say we are, I have a small um, factory and we produce garments, right? Let's say I employ a cutter, a person to cut the garments, right? And let's say that person is an integral part of my organization because unless the fabric is cut, I am not able to produce my garments, right? So this person is having a, a performing a function that is an integral part of my organization. It is not an accessory, right? When we say it's an accessory, it could mean I hire a person to paint my building. Right. So now that is not an employee. Why? Because it is not part of my it, and not, it is not an integral part of my industry. What is my industry? Garment manufacturing. Right. The third is the economic reality test. So here we try to understand whether that person who is giving you this service is in the business on his own account or on account of his employer. So here we try to understand who provides the tools and equipment. Is labor hired to perform the work? So if you're a self-employed person, you have the ability to hire other people to do the work. So you would go and get the work from a company and you yourself would hire other people to do it. So that means you don't necessarily have to give your own labor. Have that person undertaken any financial risk, right? Who is responsible for maximizing the profit, right? And whether he can profit from that business. If all of these indicates that, yes, I am able to maximize profit by reducing the headcount, right? And I have undertaken a financial risk and I profit from my business, then I will not be considered as an employee, but a self-employed person. But if all of that is not with me, if the tools are provided to me by my by the organization that I work for right and if I have to give my own labor and if I have not undertaken any financial risk right and I have no way of maximizing profit you're just paying me a monthly uh, salary then I will be considered as an employee the fourth test is called the dominant impression test so this is where the courts will decide or the labor department will decide. We're not going to just put one test for you. We're going to use multiple. We're going to use all of these tests to and understand the relevant circumstances and see the combined effect of all of by applying all of these tests to understand the nature of the relationship. So it is by applying these tests that the labor department and even the court will try to understand is this person truly an employee or is this person truly a self-employed person.
Right. Um, so now having discussed that, I want to spend some time on manpower agencies and the pre concept of a principal employee. Now, as I told you, many entrepreneurs are very reluctant in their initial years into the business to take on people as employees, because when you take on people as employees, there is a risk, right? Uh, you need to pay their salaries, you need to pay EPF, ETF, and you feel that you need a few more years to be able to take on that risk, right? So then you tie up with other agencies that's going to provide the labor or the skill that you need, right? But in Sri Lanka, this is a very tricky situation and I want you all to understand this, right? There's a famous case called the Carson Cumberbatch and Company Limited versus Nandasena. I've put it out for you here because in Sri Lanka, uh, many of, um, in understanding whether a person is an employer, an employee, uh, or whether you're a self-employed person, what we rely on is case law and not so much on the legislations, right? And what is important here is that if the manpower agency is an agency from which you have taken labor and the manpower agency has given employment contracts to those people, so that means you have given no letter of employment but the manpower agency has given a letter of employment to your resource let's call that person xyz right here what was understood is that who had the control of that xyz pro service provider right if the control of that xyz service provider is with you the, the new entrepreneur company that means you tell that person what to do. You are the one assessing that person's performance. You are the one authorizing that person's leave. Then you are considered as the principal employer, right? And the manpower agency is merely a conduit, right? Just a pipeline that gives the salary to that person. So the manpower agency is just a conduit where only the wages are being paid. But the ultimate control of that XYZ service provider is with you and you become the principal owner, sorry, principal employer. And thus, it is you who is liable for ensuring that person is paid EPF, ETF, and that you follow the other labor law requirements, right? So this is the danger in taking um, manpower, through a manpower agency. So let me now quickly run through some of the basics in uh, labor laws, right? So there are two big labor laws that you need to understand, the Shop and Office Act and the Wages Codes, right? The Shop and Office Act, as the name suggests, applies to a shop and to an office. So if you're starting a shop or an office, then it is the Shop and Office Act that would apply. But let's say you are starting some form of a manufacturing industry, right? There are 44 wages boards that are set out or 44 industries that are set out. And I have just given you four examples here, right? If you're starting something related to baking, batik, preschool, printing, security, uh, janitorial, bricklaying, um, engineering, any of those industries, right? Then you fall under the wages boards ordinance. Right? But please remember, sometimes you can have a mixture of both of these. So I'll give you an example of this. Right? Say I started a small bakery. In my bakery, all the workers who are attached to the manufacturing of it may fall under the baking trade. But there may be some, account, uh, uh, some accountants, some sales rep. Then those would fall under the component of office. So in my business, I would have certain employees coming under shop and office and certain employees coming under wages boards. So please keep that in mind. If you are starting a new business, you can fall into either both of these or one of these, right? And it is important to know that each of these regulates the terms and conditions of employment and it varies from industry to industry. 
the other is uh, the other is the need for you to pay EPF and EGF, right? So if you are employing these persons, it is important for you to know that you have to pay EPF and EGF, right? And the Sri Lankan labor law is very strict on this, right? It basically says that you have to pay EPF or ETF on the basic wage, right? On the basic wage and the BRA. So I will explain to you what BRA is in the next slide, right? And it also talks about this concept of earnings. So you have to pay EPF on the earnings. It doesn't say you have to pay EPF on the basic wage or the basic salary, but rather on the earnings, right? So payment in respect of holidays, right? Cost of living or special allowances, meal allowances, commissions, all of this is considered as earnings and you need to pay EPF on this. In Sri Lanka, what many companies do is you give a lower salary for as your basic salary. For example, you would say 30,000 is your basic salary and then you would say um, incentive and give the balance 70. So the actual take home of that person is seven is hundred thousand, but you're only paying EPF for a selected amount of thirty. Please remember that this is illegal unless your incentive is a variable. If your incentive is constant, right? It's seventy thousand and it doesn't change, then it is not a variable. It is not a it's not a true incentive like a production incentive or an attendance incentive or a skill incentive, right? And that is liable for EPF, right? But there are some exclusions in terms of EPF, right? So say I have a business and I have into my business, my spouse works and my children work, right? Then I do not need to pay EPF for them. But remember, this family is a narrow definition of family of, of your immediate family, spouse and children. So it doesn't extend it to your mother, father, aunts, uncles, etc. Right? Domestic servants, you do not need to pay EPF, ETF. Right? Directors, this means non-working directors, not working directors. Right? You do not need to pay EPF. A partner in a partnership, not required. Right? Or if you are contributing to a provident fund or some other form of pen pension scheme, established and administered outside of Sri Lanka, then you do not need to pay EPF, right? Or let's say you have a charitable institution of like a religious worship place or a social service and you have less than 10 employees, you do not need to pay EPF, right? And NITA trainees, you do not need to pay EPF. But one of the fundamentals is that there is no age limitation when it comes to EPF in Sri Lanka, if you're a lady, you can uh, you can collect your EPF contributions at the age of 50 and if you're a gent, 55. So if I employ a person who's 56 or 58 or 60 or 70, I am liable to pay EPF for that person, right? The other is law of prescription do not apply. What do we mean by that? Let's say I haven't paid EPF for the full earnings of an employee that worked under me. That employee can go and complain any time and I would have to pay. There is no prescription period of saying after three years you cannot go and ask for it, right? Or after, for example, you can't go to the labor tribunal after six months of your date of termination. This is not applicable, right? Casual workers, you're liable to pay. What do you mean by casual workers? Casual workers are people that you take in for a particular, say you have a peak production month and you need seven, eight people to come and work for you for two weeks, right? You are liable to pay EPF for them, right? And please note, if you are a director of a company, you are personally liable for non-payment. So that means if you are a director and a person goes and complains and it comes to light that the company doesn't have enough money to pay for this EPF, you are personally liable. That means you would have to sell your personal property to pay off this uh, EPF component, right? And if you are delayed in paying these EPF, then surcharges are applicable. For example, if you are delayed in like 
Uh, if your delay is in less than 10 days, then 5%, more than 10 days, less than a month, 15% and so on, right? But remember also that allowances which are reimbursable are excluded. So you don't have to pay EPF on this. So what do you mean by reimbursable, right? So let's say your sales representatives are given, um, go and um, go outstation and they stay at a particular accommodation and they pay from their own money. And when they come back to office, they get that money reimbursed. So these are reimbursables and you do not need to pay EPF on things like this. Right, uh, budgetary relief allowance. So I want, I will kind of, kind of explain this to you quickly, right? So there are two budgetary relief allowances in Sri Lanka. One that came in 2005. The 2005 budgetary relief allowance talks about if you get a basic salary of 20,000 or less, then you are eligible to get 1,000 rupees as BRA. Okay, so I've given you an example, right? So if my basic salary is 20,000, right? Then you will give me 1,000 rupees as budgetary relief allowance, right? But let's say my basic salary is 20,500, then you will only pay me 500 as BRA because there's a maximum cap of 21,000, okay? Uh, in 2015, uh, so actually, it, it came out in 2016, but it had a retrospective effect, right? So there are two budgetary relief allowances that was introduced by this act. BRA 2015 spoke about 1,500 and BRA 2016 spoke about 1,000, right? Here, the basic salary, unlike in 2005, which was 20,000, is increased. Here, the basic salary is 40,000 or less. So if you get 40,000 or less, then you get 2,500 as BRA to a maximum of 41,500. Please remember that. So that means even though the BRA allowance is 2,500, if my basic salary is 40,000, you will pay me 1,500 as a BRA, right? Please note that in the pay sheet, you need to show these things separately. You will have to say basic salary 40,000 and 1,500 as BRA, right? Uh, so you have to show it separately in the pay slip. I have given you three other examples that explains both of these BRAs together in a nutshell, right? So if my basic salary is 20,000, this example one, right? As per the 2005 BRA, I am required to pay 1,000 rupees as BRA, okay? And as per the 2015 and 2016 BRA, 2,500. So my total component of BRA would be 3,500. So my salary with the BRA would be 23,500, right? Example number two, say my basic salary is 30,000. Here, the 2005 BRA will not be applicable. Why? Because my basic salary is more than 20,000 or maximum of 21,000. Right, so it is only the 2015 and the 2016 BRA that will apply. So I would be getting only 2,500. So my basic salary with the BRA would be 32,500. Right, example number three is where I get a basic salary of 40,500. If that's the case, then the 2005 BRA would not apply because I am getting more than 20 or 21,000. And in terms of the 2015 and 2016 BRA, I will be paid only 1,000 rupees of BRA. Why? Because there's a maximum cap of 41,500. So my BRA would be 1,000 because then it would push my salary with the BRA to 41,500, right? Okay, uh, so as you grow the business, there are two things I want you to keep in mind. Please remember that as your business grows, if you employ 15 or more, then you are liable to pay in gratuity. So if you have only 14 employees, then you're not liable to pay gratuity, right? 
So uh, to, how do they count 15 or more is that in any day within the immediately preceding 12 months, if you have had 15 or more, then you have to pay gratuity, right? The Teva Act also applies if you employ 15 or more, right? And they check this to say on an average during the period of the last six months, if you had 15 or more, then the Teva Act would apply. What do we mean by the Teva Act? Teva Act talks about if you're winding up or if there's redundancy and you're and you want to terminate the services of the employee, then there's a compensation scheme that applies, right? This is what we call as the TEVA. So if you have less than 15 employees, then if you are terminating people due to winding up or due to redundancy of that role, you do not need to pay compensation. So please keep these two things in mind because as you grow the business, now you begin to see there are certain liabilities that keep adding on. So keep these things in mind and make a conscious decision when you are going to exceed 14 employees. Because that means then these are things that you need to account for and keep provisions in your budget. Right? The third thing that I want you to understand is that the labor department has various uh, powers to investigate. So employee can go to the labor department and complain on any of these matters that are listed out, right? If you've not paid uh, regarding their salary, if you delay their gratuity or you don't pay, or you don't pay EPF, ETF, right? Uh, or you don't pay their budgetary relief allowance, all of these are reasons for a person to go and complain to the Labor Department. The Labor Department would investigate these matters and give a ruling and you are bound to comply with it, right? Uh, so that's it in terms of the labor law. Let's quickly move on to uh, intellectual property because I'm conscious of the time. And I know we started 15 minutes late, so I have around I think around 10 minutes to finish off intellectual property and contract law. So let me let me try my best to do this. Um, in terms of intellectual property, there are a variety of intellectual properties, right? But we are only going to focus on four types, right? Trademark, copyright, industrial design, and patents, right? So here, a trademark, uh, is a visible sign, right, where you can easily distinguish between the goods or the services, right? If it's a service mark, we call it a service mark. If it's a trade-related mark, we call it a trademark, right? You have the choice here to register your trademark or not. So I have given some very famous trademarks, right? Um, and you, you all identify these. And sometimes you would realize in that trademark, there's a small R or there's a TM or a SM on top. The R means that this trademark is registered, right? TM means that it is not a registered trademark, right? I'm going to be discussing trademarks separately, but right now I'm just giving you a flavor so you understand the the four different types that we are talking about today, right? Copyright is rights given by law to the creator for their literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work, right? For example, lyrics, novels, scripts, poems, music compositions, teledramas, films, right? Here, you do not need to register at all. From the day you write that novel or you complete it, copyright is yours. So you do not need to register it to protect it. Industrial design means the ornamental or the aesthetic aspect of an article, right? And here registration is required. Let me give you some examples, right? The appearance of the iPhone or the appearance of a car. So industrial design means the appearance or the aesthetic aspect of an industrial article, right? A patent is rights given by law to the inventor of a scientific or a technical innovation, 
and here registration is required for you to get protection right let me quickly jump into trademarks right so trademarks as i told you is a visible sign that is capable of distinguishing the goods or services of different enterprises. So you have Coca-Cola, Pepsi, right? Uh, all of that, it, you are able to see the sign and differentiate the goods, right? So a trademark relates to goods and a service mark relates to services, right? So a trademark can be words, symbols, letters, numbers, a name, a surname, a combination, of all of these colors, shapes, right? As you know from the variety that you see out there, right? What does registration give you? And how do you register, right? So when you want to register a trademark, you apply to the um, Intellectual Property Office in Sri Lanka, right? And there is something called NIS classifications, right? That is where all the goods and services that are traded are classified into 45 classes, right? So out of these 45 classes, one to 30 are related to goods, 31 to 45 are related to services, right? Within each of these classes, classes you have subclasses, headings, and the list is endless, right? But when you want to register your trademark or your service mark, you have to mention the goods and services for which you want to register with reference to these NIS classification, right? So I'll give you an example, right? So let's say I am into producing uh, milk related products, right? So it can be milk, it can be non-fat milk, it can be full cream milk, yogurt, cheese, right? So I have to register for all of these classifications. But at the same time, I can register for things that are not very similar as well. For example, I can also have it, I can have my trademark for publications, right? So uh, let me give you an, uh, another example, right? Uh, when it comes to uh, registration, right? You can register, uh, let's take the uh, example of Everready. I'm sure you've heard of that, uh, um, Everready, the batteries, right? So they are into batteries, torches, and uh, electrical uh, classifications. So similar products to that category, right? So there was one uh, company that launched uh, Everready branded condoms, right? And now, as you can see, the product categories are different. And the question here that arose is as to whether that person who registered or who's using the Everready name for condoms, can that person do that, right? So here, what is important to note is that there are sometimes very well-known marks, right? And well-known marks, even if they are used on a dissimilar goods. So what is dissimilar? Electrical and here is condoms, right? Here, what you're doing is even though the, the goods are dissimilar, you are relying on the reputation of that well-known mark to get an unfair advantage in the market of their goods. So if that is happening, then you can prevent even though you have not registered for that specific classification. Okay, because why? It is a well-known mark and you're relying on that well-known mark's reputation to get you an unfair advantage in the marketing of the goods, right? So uh, the registration gives the owner exclusive right to use it, assign and license the mark, right? And you can enforce your right by a civil or criminal procedure, right? So, um, you can also restrain others from using your mark or a mark that is deceptively resembling your mark, right? So it has similar characteristics, then you can restrain that person from using your mark, right? Registration gives you protection for 10 years and it is 
renewable, right? So you can keep on renewing it every 10 years. But if that trademark is not used for a continuous period of five years, then another person can apply to court and get that registration canceled. Right, moving on to copyright. Copyright gives law, uh, it's basically rights given by law to the creators for their literary, dramatic and musical and artistic works, right? You have two rights under here, economic right and moral right. Economic right means it includes the right to reproduce, distribute, rent or lend or perform in public. I'll explain this to you. Let's say I wrote, wrote an hour and that manuscript, I would give the right to Vijitayapa to reproduce that book and to distribute it, right? What do we mean by rent or lend, right? Rent or lend would mean, rent means, do you remember in the back court, way back when we had VHS cassettes and we watched movies of VHS cassettes, we would go to places and rent out VHS cassettes, right? So this is the idea of being ability to rent. Lend means in terms of borrowing, borrowing books from a library, right? Perform in public. That means uh, uh, it can be a dramatization, a musical work where you perform in public, right? Communicate means here uh, electronically transmitting, right? So if you are electronically uh, Communicating it to the public, you can give that economic right as well, right? So moral rights mean the right to claim the authorship. So I have given my economic rights, but the authorship is mine. I can always claim for the authorship and I have a right to oppose to any distortion or mutilation of that work, right? The author is the first owner of the economic rights, but there are exceptions. For example, if it's a work created by an employee, then generally the owner is the employer, right? So economic rights can be assigned or licensed. What do we mean by assigned? So I'll give you a basic example. You take a house, you sell it. So assign means you're selling it, right? License means you're renting. So you take a house, you're selling it. You take a house, you're renting it. So that's the concept of assign and license, right? Sell, rent, right? So you can either sell your economic rights or rent out your economic rights. Moral rights will always belong to the author irrespective of the economic rights, right? Copyright in Sri Lanka is generally protected during the lifetime of the author and 70 years after his or her death. In terms of copyright, uh, there's one more thing that I want to tell you, right? So there is uh, the Berne Convention and the Trips Convention, right? So let's say I write a book and I begin to realize that my book is now being translated without my knowledge into Japanese in Japan. Right. So here, are, here is when the Berne Convention and the TRIPS Convention come into play. Right. Many countries, actually 180 countries or more, are part of these two conventions. Right. And if I have not given my economic right for translation for that particular um, publisher, then I can sue them in that country where the violation has occurred. So copyright is protected for you globally, provided those countries are parties to the Berne and the TRIPS Convention, right? Industrial design. This is the, as I, as we spoke about, the ornamental or the aesthetic aspect of an article, right? It doesn't have a functional character because we are just looking at the appearance of this design, right? So the design can be three-dimensional, right? Like a design of a toy, a bottle, a jewelry, a chair, things like that. Or it can be two-dimensional, like a pattern, a design for a greeting card, things like that, right? So this is protected upon registering at the intellectual property office, right? Your protection is given for five years and it's renewable for two more terms of five years. Then it stops, right? The owner of the design can exercise exclusive rights, such as making, using, importing and exporting articles comprising of such protected designs. 
right? So this is the concept in terms of industrial design and what does protection offer you. In relation to patents, patents protect inventions, right? And invention is a practical solution for a problem in the field of technology, right? And it can also relate to a product or a process, right? The patent grants the inventor a monopoly, right? That is, you have the right to exclude others from making it, using it, selling it, right? The patented invention is protected for a period of 20 years from the date of application. So some of these could be, uh, examples of this could be uh, door cooling refrigeration, right? The COVID vaccination, right? 5G technology, wearable technology, any of this is can be covered under patents, right? The owner of the patent can use it commercialize it by selling or licensing the patented technology. And you can derive financial benefits, which will indeed contribute to the growth of the economy, right? So that is why the state grant the inventor this monopoly, right? A patent is only valid in the country where it is granted. So if you apply for a patent in Sri Lanka, it is only valid in Sri Lanka, right? things to watch out for. And this is what I want entrepreneurs to really look at, right? Please use licensed versions of software. Do not use private versions because companies are keeping an eye out and really cracking down on their intellectual property and the usage of private software. So please keep an eye out for this and do not engage in these kind of practices. Right? Images on the internet, right? Uh, there was, there are many instances where we all just see a nice picture on the internet and we use that, right? Please make sure that that particular image that you are taking from the, um, from, from that particular website, right? That it, that it's from the uh, stock gallery and it is paid for. Or if it's, if it's a free image, then it will specifically say it is a free image, right? For example, if you're in an advertising company, you see a nice photo or an image and you think you're going to use it for, for this particular advertising, right? And you put that image in and your client runs with it and they publicize that whole campaign using that image, the owner of that image has the right to sue that company who used that image and return that company that you provided this image for can sue you, right? So please be careful if you are using images on the internet to make sure that they are either free or pay for it and then take it, right? Then deceptive use of a mark. So these are things that have happened in Sri Lanka, right? Uh, there's a famous uh, mark, courtyard by Marriott that is globally famous, right? And Sri Lanka had a hotel that went Colombo courtyard, right? And later they had to change their name and it is now changed to Colombo Court Hotel and Spa. Right, because this is where you are using a deceptively, you're using a very well known mark for the marketing of your company. Right, similarly, I think way back uh, a long time ago, in a news first was known as NTV and they had to change their name. Right, so please be careful. You might think I'm just a small entrepreneur, no one's going to know. Please know, thanks to the internet, people are going to know if you are using a deceptively similar mark of another company, right? So please keep an eye out for things like this, right? Singing or sampling another musician, musician, sorry, singing or sampling another mus, okay, I'm having an issue, musician song in public, right? So this is where, you take on 
a song which is written and sung by someone else and you're singing it in public, be careful, you can be sued because you have to have the approval or the authorization of the owner of that song for you to sing it in public, right? If you're singing it at home or with your friends, it's different, but if you are making a living out of it, then it is a different ballgame. Contract law, right. Um, so in terms of contract law, I will get down straight to it, right? There is no legislation or statutory acts that are governing contract law, right? What governs contract law is case law, right? And what we mean by case law is where lower courts follow the reasoning of the higher courts in similar and subsequent cases and the reasons for ju judgment, right? Giving, uh, governing the interpretation of that case law, right? So it is what we call a judicial precedent, right? So it is case law that is applied in contract. Even though they say a contract can be in writing or oral, I would always advise you all to please have it in writing. Do not rely on oral contracts because this can get you into trouble. If you have it in writing, the terms and conditions are very clear and specific, and this will help all parties. Right? For a contract to be legally enforceable, there are six of these elements that needs to be fulfilled. I'm not going to talk to you about all of these six because it's very lengthy and it's very deep subject matter. But what I want you to understand is for a contract to be enforceable, you must have an offer. That means you offer something to somebody, someone has to accept it. Then there must be some form of payment to it, which we call as consideration, right? And you must have an intent to have legal force. What do we mean by it? Meaning promises have no intention of legal force. I'll give you an example of a promise, right? A promise that a parent gives a child. If you pass your exams really well, I will take you to watch a movie, right? These are promises that we have no intention of having a legal force, right? So that is that will not be considered as a as a uh, as a promise that has any intention of having any legal force, right? The other is legality of the contract. You cannot get into illegal uh, uh, terms and conditions and expect it to be, have some form of legality, right? For example, I cannot get into a contract with the person where I say, this person owes a debt to me, I want you to uh, incapacitate him, I want you to break his leg, right? These are illegal uh, contracts, so you, it has no legality in the eyes of the law. The other is legal capacity. Legal capacity means, does that person actually own that? Does, is that person above the age of 18 years? Is that person sane? Right? So all of these elements need to come into force for a contract to be legally enforceable. Right? I'm not going to go into in detail of this, but my um, simple uh, request for you is when you are going into a contract, please have it in writing. And if you cannot afford a lawyer to get your contract sorted out, then please follow these basics. Right? So if it's a supplier contract, right? please do not go out there and hunt out um, contracts that are available on the internet and then just copy it. Right? Please read it to see whether every single word is understandable by you. Right? And make the language as simple as possible, fitting the requirement that you have. Right? Please just don't copy paste thinking this is the language to use, I'm going to use this language, right? Ideally, you should go to a lawyer and get your contracts um, accurately done because it has to reflect your terms and conditions. But if you cannot, then please make sure the language that you're using is simple and you understand. 
right? So in terms of a supplier contract, make sure the names and addresses of the parties are there. The time frame for responsibilities are set out. When do I need to deliver this within three months, right? Pricing, payment details, including the invoicing process. So if you have pricing like 50% as a down payment, then the other you're breaking it down in terms of the way you perform that contract, then please make it simple and easy and where you understand, right? What are the performance criteria and review process? confidentiality clauses, if there are, right? Refunds in terms of compensation, right? Levels of after sale service, if there is any, right? So all of these you need to put in and make sure they are in simple language. In terms of employment contracts, I have set out a similar list that you can have, right? In terms of non-disclosure agreements, right? Uh, non-disclosure non agreements, there's a particular purpose for it. This is where we prohibit someone from sharing information which is deemed confidential, right? Where we use, uh, when disclosing secrets or to a contractor, a potential investor, a prospective business partner, an employee, a consultant, you can get people to uh, sign a non-disclosure agreements that will ensure that the confidential information that you're sharing stays confidential, right? Non-disclosure agreements, again, are very complicated. And I would advise for you, uh, if you're starting a new business and you're looking to share your business ideas with the prospective business partner, first enter into a non-disclosure agreement. In that agreement, define what is confidential information and then disclose your business idea because otherwise that person can uh, is not bound by this non-disclosure agreement and your business idea can go to the wrong hands. So this is what I wanted to cover in this uh, one hour and 15 minutes. I think I overstretched a little bit. Please excuse me. And these are the useful links that are there. And as you can go to the Divisional Secretariat of Colombo, which will set out applications uh, for you to register as a sole proprietorship or a partnership. Department of Register of Companies will give you all the details in terms of uh, how to register a private limited company, what are the model articles of association, uh, and how to do your online registering, how to reserve your name, all of this is there. It's very easy to understand. In terms of the Department of Labor, you can go there to understand. Uh, you can find all the relevant acts that are necessary, right? And also get help in certain things in understanding, right? The National Intellectual Property Office, the website is there for you to understand more in depth. What is a trademark? What is a um, patent? How do you register? What's the time frame? What are the fees? All of this is readily and easily available, right? So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Pumi, we can take in questions uh, if we are to go on. Pumi, can you help me out with the questions? Hello. Hi. Good morning. Hello. Hi, yeah. good morning. Thank, thank you for the awareness program. Actually, I have a few questions to ask. Actually, is it okay to apply SOFA and Office Act for a garment factory instead of uh, wages board ordinance? Hello? You have to. Can you please ask me that question again? Class, class. Yeah, actually, is it okay to apply Shop and Office Act for a garment, fa garment factory instead of uh, wages ordinance ordinance? No, you cannot. That is wrong. If the workers are engaged in um, manufacturing the garment, right? For example, um, sewing machine operators, ironers, right? they fall under the wages board. If you look at the wages boards of the garment industry, it sets out classifications of designations. 
take a look at that. It's available on the Labor Department website, right? Then you will understand who in the garment industry falls into that wages board, right? Those people have to be governed under the wages board, while the others, like your planning executives, your receptionist, your HR, your accountants, finance, all of those would fall under the Shop and Office Act. Thank you. Another one is, if a company has 14 employees, is that entity liable for gratuity? No. And uh, if any company has 14, uh, if any employee has completed four years and six months uh, employment period in the company, uh, is that company liable to pay gratuity for him? No, because the um, legally it says you have to complete five years. Right, so in this instance, if they have only completed four years and six months, then you are not legally uh, obligated to pay, but the Labor Department may push you to ask whether you can keep that person for four more months and pay this because it's very at the end of that stage. So they may ask you or make a request to you whether that's possible or if you don't want to keep that person for the next four months, then as to whether, sorry, next six months, then as to whether um, you are willing to pay for it. So they may make that request. Um, I'm just going to uh, answer another question that has come in. Where to get the model articles of association? So I think I answered this. Model articles are in the schedule to the Companies Act 2007 and you can download it from the ROC website which I uh, shared with you, right? Um, there's another one, uh, Government Office uh, can a government officer start a business? No. Under establishment code, a government officer can't have any other employment. Okay. Uh, then there is a cost of a um, patent. Someone has asked. Official fees and lawyer's fees. Those are what you have to pay, right? So the official fees are... I think it's 2875 to file a patent application by an individual or rupees 6900 to file a patent applied by a company. Lawyer's fees, of course, will depend uh, because the lawyer's fee will help to draft the uh, patent application. Right? Uh, one more, I think. Can you apply for a global patent? Yes. There is a system called PCT or Patent Cooperation Treaty, right? You can file a PCT application at the IP office in Sri Lanka, right? Another one, can you register LTD company online? Yes, same process as the private limited company. Uh, right, so there's a, I'm sorry if I miss all your questions. I'm trying to stay, uh, on top, I hope I can. There's another one by Aslam. If an employee is moving to a competitive company, can the employer not pay gratuity? No, that is illegal. Gratuity is paid for the service you have offered to that particular company. So if you have completed five years, then you have to pay. You cannot hold that person's uh, gratuity. If, you, uh, uh, if your gratuity is not paid, please make a complaint to the labor department and uh, they will call the employee to come in and you will be able to get your gratuity. Uh, Danny, there was another question. Uh, do you have to register an online business? If so, what is the procedure? So your business has to fall into one of these three things. You, you can be online, it, it doesn't matter, right? Sole proprietorship, um, partnership and the company and the types of there, right? But if you are an online company, right, I suggest you do have a private limited company and it is better that you do register it as a private limited company because you are engaging with a bigger network and your visibility is more. So I think that is necessary. I don't know. If a government person cannot uh, register the business, uh, how can he join and take the control of the business. I'm sorry, I did not hear you. Can you tell me again? 
Especially if a government worker is uh, uh, not allowed to register a business, uh, how can he uh, take part of a business? If a government, uh, okay, so if a government worker wants to start a business, how can you start a business? That's your question, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Then you will have to register it under your spouse's name or maybe a family member. If you have, yeah. Uh, 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 is that the only method? That is the only method. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right. No register. Uh, I think there's a question for should one register NDA? No, you don't register in NDA. I think there's a question from uh, Shamila. Is the budgetary relief allowance dependent on the amount of basic salary only or can, can be considered for the total of basic salary and fixed allowances? It is for the budgetary allowance is dependent on the basic salary. So if my salary is 19,000, Please note 2005 BRA and the 2016 BRA applies to me, right? So it is not based on the uh, fixed allowances. And there's another question. If a business is registered uh, uh, in the house hello? address. Hold on, Anam. I think uh, someone's asking a question. Okay, yes. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, tell me. Gaini, there's a question uh, from the panel. Uh, if the business is registered for a house address, would there be any kind of uh, negative uh, consequences if something arises? Because, no. uh, well, it really depends. Is your business a sole proprietorship or a partnership? Right? Uh, because if you are a sole proprietor or a partnership, as I told you, the liability is unlimited right but if it's a private limited company and you've given your private home address there's no issue there because limited limit anyway there's no actually there's no issue unless you're in debt anam you can ask the question anam you had okay, a question thank you. Uh, yes please yeah any uh, i want to know uh, how many articles are there for the companies uh, I will be, uh, can I able to see it, like articles? Well, you can go to the uh, ROC website and the model articles yeah. of association are there. So the model articles. Examples are there. Yes, yes. Just just go on to that. ROC, and, you know? Yes, ROC website and the model yeah. articles of association are there and you can have a read through. It's very uh. simple. It will tell you how to what are the objectives, how are profits shared, things like that are all there. So you can read it and see whether that fits your requirement, right? And they guide you, actually. Actually, there's a big um, guidebook there as well that you can read, right? So if you spend some time on that website, it really is geared for entrepreneurs to do things on their own. And I would really encourage you all to, of course, it would take a lot of time and I know it would be easier just to go to someone and get their advice. But if you don't have that kind of money to spend, then spend some time uh, on that website. It really does, um, is a big support for entrepreneurs. Hello. 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 Uh, I want to. Uh, hello. Yes. Sorry, I lost audio. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, this is Amar. I have a question. Yes, Amma. Uh, no, I, I asked earlier about the patent. I And you explained about the global patent. There's a possible way that we could apply global patent. Correct. Uh, what will be its validity and what will be the cost from government and if you're like applying globally? 
And is it apply, applicable for all the countries? Uh, that is subjective, to be honest, whether it's applicable for all the countries, right? Uh, in terms of cost, I think, uh, Amma, I do not specifically know the cost right now, but I know that it is on the website because it has the fees and all uh, set out because it really depends on the official fees of the foreign IP officers, right? So it's, it's difficult for me to uh, give you a number per se, right? And you also asked for the validity period of a, uh, a global uh, patent, did you not? Yes, yes, yes. So it's 20 years, that applies. That's 20 years, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, madam, I, what is the link that I should refer for this? Go to the ROC website. ROC website. Sorry, okay, uh, thank uh, you. IP. sorry, 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 IP. The National IP uh, Protection Office website. Okay, okay, thank you. There was another question, if I, uh, somebody had asked about royalty, but I, mean, I saw it now, where was the question? Uh, should royalty contracts be registered, right? Yes, royalty contracts should be registered. Achala, you have asked, can you mention that website again? I'm wondering which website. Um, so there are Hello? a couple of websites uh, that are useful. Sorry, yes? Yeah, it's about the website you mentioned that like the every entrepreneur should uh, kind of uh, read okay. before. Let me quickly share that slide again so that we all are, just give me a minute. Let me share that slide. So here we go.